I'd like to welcome you to our first virtual Meet the Authors program. My name is Chris Pastrangeli. I work at Central Library in Virginia Beach. Today, we are pleased to have with us Dr. Morgan Bosch, Ha Kofi Obeng, Stephen Poplin, Juju Rafi, and Tiffany Gallup. First, we'll hear from Dr. Morgan Bosch. Good morning, everyone. I just would love to share with you a little bit about a book that I recently wrote with my mother, and it is called Being Charlie Embracing Differences. My background is in special education. I am a special education professor at Barton College down in North Carolina, and my specialty there is working with people that want to either be teachers or administrators in the field of autism. Going through my degrees and my experience as a uh, adaptive special education teacher brought me to kind of uh, epiphany that there are not many books out there about individuals with autism that they can kind of connect with. And so my mom in the past has always talked about writing a children's book as I was growing up and uh, we would read stories together. She all often talked about a Canada goose that kind of just warmed her heart and she would kind of go on and on about the different adventures of this goose. And so when she retired, uh, she decided that she wanted to write this children's book. And I said to her, hey, mom, let's let's add autism into it. Let's, you know, put both of our minds together and create something really special. And so that's kind of how we started with this idea. And we moved it into thinking about the goal and the um, you know, passion behind the book was to realize that we can embrace uniquenesses of individual differences. And so we decided to come up with a theme for the book. And the theme is together we can be different and still belong. And so that kind of brought my special ed background into her storyline of meeting this Canada goose and bringing in uh, facts and different um, ideas about migration. Even the night sky was a big um, thing that we used to talk about when I was growing up. And so we brought some of these different things in, in from both of our loves and passions. And that is how Charlie started. And so we are really excited to share it with everyone. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit about Charlie and the beginning of uh, the book and get some interest in how it shows a little bit about him as a, a goose or individual with autism. So Charlie is a Canada goose who is unlike his siblings. He has autism. Swimming, honking, and flying are challenging. He's hesitant to swim because the water's always too cold for him. And when he learns to honk, it's so loud that it hurts his ears. And so in the book, you see that he covers his ears with his wings. And then when he's flying, the sun is just so bright. So he flies upside down to keep it out of his eyes. The family flock doesn't at first understand all these differences, but they soon realize that Charlie's different and that they all belong together. And so these words and illustrations that you see throughout the book, they're gonna bring awareness and understanding and acceptance for individual differences. And that's where that theme ties in with together we can be different and still belong. There are a couple places that you can go to get some more information about the book. Um, we have been working really hard to create an Instagram and a Facebook to have some social media, um, you know, prefer, you know, prevalence out there for us. And one of the really cool things about the book that we decided to do, and I actually have the book here with me today, and I wanted to show a little, little blurb about it here at the end, is that you'll see here that um, there's a picture of Charlie, I'll move in just a little bit, there we go. And what this is, and you can also find this on our Instagram and our Facebook, but it's actually a little activity for readers to complete at the end of the book. And it's called, We Are Charlie. And what you do is there's a picture of Charlie and you are to add to it any way that makes you feel different. So we've had some people submit Charlie with glasses or Charlie that might have freckles or red hair or noticing that he's really tall or he's shorter 
or maybe that he has a, that he's in a wheelchair. So we've asked our readers to kind of individualize Charlie and make it so that what you how you feel different, you show us on Charlie and then they send it to us and we've been uploading them to our Instagram and Facebook page with our hope that all these readers can see that there are so many other people out there that feel that they have differences. So again, promoting that we can all be different, but still belong together. And this has been really exciting for us, especially in the time here that we've been in quarantine and that everyone has kind of um, had to be, you know, less social interaction. This has been something that we are hoping that will bring our community together. So it's, we're really excited to do that. Um, we've also done a little video on our Instagram that talks about how Charlie feels different and have encouraged others to record a short little video, um, the We Are Different challenge to bring in what their differences are. And again, the hopes to create a community around that. So please check out our Instagram and our Facebook and, and get some ideas. And if you read the book and love it, send us your Charlie so that we can add you to our uh, collage of many pictures. You can find the book on Amazon. You can also find it on Barnes and Noble's website and they have it as a hardback, a paperback, and you can also go to iTunes and get it there. So we hope that you check it out and we really look forward to hearing from you and seeing some pictures. As to advice for inspiring authors, the one thing that I say that's really strong since my mom and I wrote the book together is if you hear yourself saying over and over, I would like to write a book, then do it, go for it, start that journey. Because I can still remember being that five-year-old kid sitting in my bed at night when it's time for our bedtime stories. And instead of my mom pulling out a book, she pulled out this book about Charlie and we would go through adventures and it is just something that we've always had in common. And it's been a great experience for us to do this and work together. And we always kept saying that we were gonna do it. You know, oh yeah, we'll do that, we'll do that. But don't put it off, go for it, um, go for the challenge. It's, it's so much fun and to see your words on paper and to see the whole process and then to have that book that you made in your hand and know that you had a part in that is just such an amazing feeling. We're actually working on our second one now. And so instead of it being Charlie embracing differences, we're going to go through all of his siblings. So it's going to be the next one is going to be being Gus embracing differences. And the exciting part about that is that Gus is his big brother. And there are so many kids out there or individuals that have autism that can talk about a family member that is kind of their caretaker and the one that they hold close and is kind of their protector. And that's the next storyline with Gus. So we hope you'll love Charlie and we hope you'll check out our next one with being Gus. Thanks for your time today. Morgan, thank you so much. I'm wondering, do, do, does any of the other authors have questions for Morgan today? Yeah, this is Paco. I do. How was it writing with a family member? I've always been curious how it is to write with a family member. Sure. Yeah, actually, you know, it was really, it was fun because um, it was kind of neat because the year that I um, started my profession as a college professor, the same year my mom retired. So we kind of had the switching of the hats. And so as soon as she retired, she's like me, you know, type A, likes to do stuff all the time. She's like, I don't know what to do with myself. So I said, hey, this is the perfect time, let's do it. So we started together and the great thing was, I think because we have, you know, she was an education professor also, but she was not special ed. So she had the content of the book down pat. She knew the storyline and what she wanted to do. And then I was able to bring my special ed background into it and the autism and kind of the different, the parts about the uniquenesses and individual differences. So it was, it was almost perfect because we played off each other so well and we didn't step on each other's toes because I knew she knew all about the, you know, the storyline that she wanted. And I knew what I wanted to add to make Charlie special and unique. And um, so that was really fun. Um, a lot of the time, like when we did the editing um, process, I worked with the publisher 
uh, you know, because it was just too hard to have both of us doing input at the same time. So I kind of like would do it and then send it to my mom and say, it, here are some things I thought, do you have anything to add? But I made sure that I was the, you know, point of contact for them because otherwise, it, absolutely, it would have been hard to go back and forth with three people. Um, but it was really fun. I think it actually, I mean, my mom and I are pretty close anyway, but I think it actually kind of showed us the other person's professional love and passion that we didn't know before because we were always just mother daughter. And this time it was almost like two professionals um, collaborating together. And it was like really kind of a neat experience. Um, it was funny because we were like, well, if we like it, you know, at first we were a little hesitant. Well, if we enjoy it, then maybe we'll write another one. You know, it was like we we held off to to commit, but we really enjoyed it, had a good time, and um, you you know, we we're already starting to talk about doing it again. So yeah, it's it's fun. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else with questions for Morgan? If not, I have just one, and my question would be: Do you think that anybody can write a book? Or be an author, however you want to look at it. Well, I'll answer that in in one in first one perspective. It is very time consuming um, to work with the kind of the whole process of sending the manuscript, getting feedback with the editing process, making sure that it's perfect, um, and then kind of working through the illustrations and then the final you know pieces at the end. Um, we went back and forth so many times to, you know, little things like making sure that the page setup was what you wanted, making sure that there were enough page breaks or line breaks, or you want the picture bigger or smaller. So I would say the hard, you know, one of the hardest parts in my mind, because we had this story already, because we had an illustrator already, those things were already kind of nailed down at the beginning. The hardest part was just the tediousness of back and forth with the publisher to make sure that it was up to our standards because we knew that once that book was published and put out there it has our name on it it has our passion and love behind it we wanted it perfect and so that whole process was um you know just a little bit you know tedious and time consuming to do so i would say that you have to make sure that you set aside the time so that the the final product is up to your standards. I think that would be the biggest thing um, to make sure that that was something that you had in mind and realize that it's not a quick process. Um, I guess the second thing I would add to that is make sure that if it is something you want to do, that when you decide on a publisher to use, that you have really vetted all the options and you you know weigh the pros and cons of each option you have to make sure that you are um, going to be satisfied with the end product. Thank you so much, Morgan. Stephen, did you have something? Okay, Morgan, yes, very good job. Um, I recognize, of course, that uh, there's that editing process, and then there's the re-editing process, and, you know, and it goes on and on. And the re-editing and the re-editing. So, exactly, exactly. But you've got two authors, you know, and so who, you know, in the process, who had like the final edit? You know what I mean? Um, I think we made sure that both of us gave the thumbs up. Um, and and it was help. You know, I was the one that always submitted it back to our editor because we didn't want you know two people working on that. So I kind of looked it over, sent it to my mom. She looked it over and sent it back to me, and then I went with it. So I guess if you had to say it in that terms, I was the final editor. However, I didn't submit anything without her thumbs up. All right, Morgan, thanks so much. I think we're going to go ahead and move on to Pa Kofi. Awesome. Thank you guys. I'm sorry I can't stick around. I actually have to take the class this morning. So I appreciate all of you. And I can't wait to look at it when you send it. Send it. And uh, you guys stay in touch. If there's, you know, anything that we can do, continue this. I'd love to, you know, be a part of the community. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, guys. Alrighty. Bye-bye. All right, Pa Kofi, you're on.
All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me for this um, virtual author um, presentation. Uh, my name is Paco Fiobang. I go by the um, okay. name P.B. Obang on my fiction books. I was born in Maryland, um, but raised in New York, Ohio. Um, went to college and medical school in Ohio. Went to Ohio State uh, for my undergrad. Uh, my day job, believe it or not, is an in, as an internal medicine physician. Uh, even though I write fiction, I'm actually a, a medical doctor. Um, but essentially, you know, we all have um, uh, uh, things that we like outside of our profession. So growing up, I, I earned for stories that touched on themes of family, power, and responsibility. Um, and essentially what I wanted to focus on was writing for uh, readers that long for layered storylines featuring diverse characters um, that you care about. I also have a, a, a great fondness for movies. I'm sure a lot of people love a lot of Marvel movies. I'm a big Marvel movie fan. Um, so, and I, I love those characters. Definitely, I love characters of color who are represented in a positive and intelligent way. And my aim in terms of writing was also to kind of incorporate that cinematic experience in uh, my fiction writing. Right. And so, uh, um, so my debut novel is, is called Vigil. It's a sci fi political thriller. Basically, follows a team of superhuman operatives from various, various government agencies that discover a conspiracy that will have earth shattering consequences. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, with my love of comics and love of movies, think of it basically as a Tom Clancy meets the Avengers. All right. So, um, in terms of the book, um, in terms of where you can purchase it, it's available on Amazon, Google Play, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, um, and then also too, you can uh, see other links on my website, www.pbobang.com, um, where you can get not only the links for the book, but also you can get some background on the characters because there are five main characters. I'm not going to go into in depth, but basically um, they're the main uh, uh, characters on the team. So Alicia Conrad is, is a, I would say, probably the focal, emotional focal point of the book. And as you read the book, you'll kind of get to know her story and also the story of the other characters as well as you learn about uh, the plot that they, unco uh, that they uncover while they uh, investigate um, an earth shattering event. Pakovi, did you want to read an excerpt from your book? Were you prepared to do sure. that? Would you like to? You go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I was interested. In, I was going to read uh, the first prologue from the book. So um, I'm going to start now. So prologue one. So the date is June 1st uh, in uh, the uh, the city of Delahar in, in Lamalia, which is based in the um, eastern Mediterranean region. Um, three bullets. With only three bullets, a world leader's life is snuffed out. Just three bullets are all it takes to throw a nation into chaos and set the world on fire. Mohan Aldessa was a newly elected president of the small Eastern Mediterranean nation of Lamalia. As a nation, it is as much a melting pot as the United States. With ethnic origins in Europe, North and Eastern Africa and Southeast Asia. Today was inauguration day for the country's first democratically elected president in over 50 years. Sadly, what was meant to be a joyous occasion devolves into chaos. As onlookers react in horror and disbelief, Aldessa's security detail immediately converges on his body, instinctively brandishing their automatic weapons as they look up to return fire. The police make a failed attempt to maintain calm. Hysteria overtakes a crowd and a major stampede ensues and dozens are tra trampled in a tumult. Amidst the confusion, a sniper on the rooftop of the adjacent parliament building meticulously field strips his weapon, a Remington 7.62 millimeter M4 away sniping rifle. The man dressed in cargo pants, a black t-shirt and well-worn uh, field jacket carefully places a dismantled rifle into a rectangular weapons case. He pulls a small silver colored uh, cell phone uh, from his inner coat pocket and presses pound seven on the touchscreen. As he lifts the phone to his ear, his coat sleeve slides back, revealing a distinctive tattoo of a bald eagle clutching lightning in one claw and arrows in the other. The call is answered. It's done, the sniper says in a sterile tone. He nods in acknowledgement of the orders given by the other uh, person on the, on the line, and he responds, I understand. The sniper ends the call, grabs his belongings, and quickly retreats from the rooftop. As he leaves, the man fails to notice the security camera perched on the satellite tower above him. So that's just an um, excerpt of Prologue 1 to kind of get uh, you interested in the storyline, you know, what happened, you know, why was the president assassinated? And so I delve into that as the book progresses. So, yeah, it's uh, it, I had a fun time writing it. So. All right, Paco, so this is your advice to aspiring authors. Sure. So um, 
in terms of advice to uh, uh, aspiring authors, I say write something that you would want to read and also write every day. I think the challenge for me um, as an author was, okay, how do I write this? What do I do? Um, how do I, uh, um, you know, target uh, my audience and things like that? But when it boils down to it, especially for me when it comes to fiction writing, it's just writing something that I'm interested in. Um, believe it or not, there are a lot of people who are interested in things that you like. Um, and a lot of times we feel like we're the only person that likes certain topics or certain subjects. But now I think um, in our internet age and the fact that um, I feel like there are no no real gatekeepers like there used to be when it, when it comes to content creation, that you can write whatever you, you want and there's an audience there for you. It doesn't matter how obscure you might think it is. But if it's something that you like, there's definitely an audience out there for it. So I just... Um, advise any aspiring author just write something that you want to write and read as well yourself and then you'll you'll come up with a great book so that's what I have to say all right thank you so much to, to Juju or Stephen do you have any questions for Pakofi um, if not I'll have a question Pakofi my question to you is do you do or did you have to do a lot of research for your book Yes, thank you so much for asking that question, Chris. I did. Um, I had to do a lot of research in terms of the background of the characters because they're in different agencies. Some are in the Army, some are in the FBI, some are in the CIA. So I had to do a little, little bit of background um, research in terms of um, operations for um, certain agencies, whether it be CIA agents, FBI. Then I also had to look into uh, some of the, I want to make it as authentic as possible. So I had to look into also like the weapons and stuff like that. So that kind of added to it as well. So um, so yeah, I did have to do a fair amount of research and I'm still doing that for the second book, which is coming out. I'm hoping to release in 2021, later on, maybe late summer, early fall, which is a, the, the basically the continuation of the, of the first book. Um, but the, the focus more so is kind of the effects of um, technology and how that affects a team as well. Um, and I, I like to touch on certain themes that are relevant, and, but still, you know, still um, make the storyline very fun and exciting. So. All right, Paul Kofi, thank you so much. Now yeah. we're going to go ahead and move along to Stephen Poplin. Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Stephen Poplin, and um, I have been... Um, uh, searching, searching my whole life, uh, wondering uh, how all of this fits together. And I had attended um, six different universities uh, in different uh, nations, um, trying to uh, piece together uh, once I started like awakening to um, there, this place down here on Earth is such a fascinating, complex place. And yet there seems to be some chaos here and, you know, some some search for meanings. So, um, Going to these uh, different universities, I was uh, always searching for how does it all fit together. So anyway, I ended up with a philosophy degree amongst other things. And uh, and then I had some close friends said, well, very good, Stephen. What are you going to do with that philosophy degree? <laughs> and uh, uh, sure enough, I had to then start thinking about a career. And um, so I uh, studied uh, hypnosis and became a hypnotherapist and followed the Hindu perspective of past lives, reincarnation, following the soul, recognizing that here we are uh, born into this world, ha having our brief strut across our stages, and then we go on. And um, so a fascinating journey, of course, but then uh, wanting to find out okay, we've got the theory, we've got the philosophy, there seems to be some very interesting dynamics here, and uh, and now what? Uh, so I, over the decades, have hypnotized thousands of people, many of them my clients, who have their individual stories of what happens, you know, after death, and where do we go, what, what have we learned, what about this thing called karma, and then reincarnation. So again, over the decades, I have uh, hypnotized people and then we go into those past lives and I, I truly strive to say, let us find that specific past life that has a relevance for today. If someone has a particular propensity, for instance, or there may be some emotional issues, some uh, uh, strong desires, uh, does that have some sort of origin 
outside of our, of course, early family upbringings. You know, the family can tell us a lot of things. And then we have found uh, that uh, one has been with our families before. And we have played different roles. We have been in different races, different cultures, different times. And then we reincarnate together as this uh, ensemble, as this team, uh, so that we can learn those lessons, pay off the old karma, and uh, uh, do our best to experience our life and to live our truths and to contribute to this world, to this life as we have today. So um, I uh, took probably uh, 10 years to uh, collect all of my notes and my ideas uh, to come up with these two volumes that actually I started just writing so much that it turned into a rather large book. And I, I said, well, we have to divide this somehow. And so it became volume one and two. But Inner Journeys, Cosmic Sojourns is the title. This is the second volume right here. And it's called Life Transforming Stories, Adventures, and Messages from a Spiritual Hypnotherapist Casebook. And I found myself uh, living in Europe for 10 years and, uh, again, collecting all kinds of interesting stories from my uh, European um, clients. And, again, from there, going into ancient Greece or Rome or China or some obscure island uh, that uh, who knows where they were and interacting and learning and then reincarnating in our present bodies. And uh, I was so stimulated with that, as well as, of course, being in Europe, you know, it's like in, in uh, two hours, you're in another country, uh, speaking another language. And so, uh, well, uh, that was uh, not only exciting for me, um, but it kept me from actually writing this book. Uh, and so it took actually um, a move over towards the Midwest into Iowa for a few years where I must admit I wasn't so stimulated. And uh, so then I had a chance to uh, go ahead and sit myself down and do the writing, collecting the stories and uh, putting it together. And uh, as a philosopher, I'm wanting to, you know, uh, organize it in such a way because it's so complex, you know, different parts and syntheses and subjects and themes um, that kind of build this complex and interesting life that we have. So one can uh, um, purchase these books. They are um, uh, also uh, in print uh, as well as Kindle. And I'm also a photographer. And so it's filled with lots of uh, different images and pictures and themes that uh, partly, remembering now that I'm a hypnotherapist, that I would like to stimulate you as you read the passages as well as look at the images that maybe there could be some new impressions, feelings, and so forth that may come to you. I must admit also that I like the uh, Kindle uh, version two because uh, my photography is in color with the uh, books it's a black and white thing it's still wonderful still great uh, but there's always something special about you know uh, colorful uh, images and so forth so uh, one can um, look up my name Stephen Poplin or uh, Google inner journeys cosmic sojourns and I personally have looked myself up uh, to find out, like, where else uh, are my books to be found? I've been surprised sometimes where it shows up. Goodreads uh, shows up there, uh, Barnes & Noble. I even found an Asian company that was uh, printing my books. I go, who are you? <laughs> fine, fine. But also with um, Amazon, one can find that. Yeah. Stephen, did you want to read an excerpt from one of your books as well today? Yes, yes, I, I had something uh, picked out here. Again, uh, with the um, Inner Journeys, Cosmic Sojourns, this is from uh, Volume 2, and I've already introduced uh, the larger topic and, you know, kind of like how this reincarnation works. And then I go into uh, different themes, 
And this is in a, a theme connected with what are called a bleed throughs. And that means a strong personality from a past life uh, is kind of overlaying or influencing our present incarnation. And that uh, means sometimes that um, from out of the blue or out of character, we might have these interests or ideas or sometimes these periodic times that we'll just say something or do something. They say, oh, that's not typical of what you would say. But as a hypnotist, as a reincarnationist, I'd say, oh, that's coming from uh, the year 372. <laughs> so here we have a, a group of people and one can probably recognize them uh, because uh, they're probably uh, uncles or uh, people that we have met along the way. And they too have something about the past that is influencing them. I've had several old warrior clients who regaled glorious lives of exuberance and daring. Those swashbucklers of old were also prone to impulsiveness and aggressiveness. In their present incarnations, they are more theoretical warriors with smaller, weaker bodies. They intuitively understand combat and strategies and enjoy adventure films and books and military history. Dig a little deeper and one will find that combative nature, but they can't back it up with an athletic body or a military career to match. And that was the plan. With a slower, weaker body, these men and some women were forced to find other alternatives to war and brute force. Oftentimes, this redirected energy or drive was expressed intellectually or socially. The goal-oriented inner warrior had to work smarter, think strategically, and develop teamwork. Conquering was out of the question. Such blatant aggression was previously overdone. Discussion, debate, argument, and motivation are to be developed to reach goals this time around. Yes, spirit choices of body types and temperaments are strategically planned. Whether you, the now personality, like it or not. All right, Stephen, what about some advice to aspiring authors? What would you tell people looking to write a book? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one can see here from this um, uh, snippet here that I wrote, uh, the big number one is to sit thy butt down on your chair in front of your uh, desk and just to do it. <laughs> and of course, uh, there is the writing process and the initial juices and the creativity and say, oh, I can go in that direction or here's another great story over here. Uh, and yes, yes, write all of that down and, and truly be consistent, really get on it, do it. Uh, and, and then comes the editing and the re-editing and that process. And, and here's something that I, I also learned years ago. We sometimes have our precious words and we say oh this is so good you know i, I just got to keep it in even though it doesn't seem to fit anymore in the third or fourth edition uh, but you don't it, it's your baby so you don't want to get rid of it um, however i have also learned that one can then have another file folder uh, digitally and those are you know very clever wordings of things but it, you know, I can't use it here. So it's not lost, you know, take it out, save it in another thing. And maybe at some other point you can get, you, you can use it in another book, another writing. And so that's uh, uh, where I'm at right now. There are so many stories that again, almost each of them can bring up another um, theme, another chapter, um, something to learn, something that we can all learn from. Uh, and I'm writing now uh, a book connected to Utopia 
and Utopia is looking into the future. And so it's uh, a, a different dynamic. I'm basing it, of course, on the larger perspective of why are we all here? What are we all doing? And uh, and then where can we go? Where Where is the ultimate goal of all of this? And of course, number one, we really need to start getting along together. And um, so cooperation and a vision of a better future for, for us all. And so it's a, a book on utopia that perhaps could be a movie at some point. And, uh, but back to the um, advice to those uh, authors, um, there are those times that you are really in the flow and other times where you just can't get that mind working, you know, it's like, it seems to be stuck at some point. Recognize that again, you know, just like, you know, today is the um, vernal equinox, uh, there are these special times that are, you got more juice and other times it's not much happening. So if you can make even a small contribution when it, when it's just not right there, maybe even the block, or the temporary stop might have like a theme in it. So indeed, still write that down, keep on going because you know you, there will be some other days in which is really going to flow. And that's when it, it's really great. And then you get quite excited with that process of allowing things to just flow. Thank you so much, Stephen. Does anyone have questions for Stephen today? Yeah, I do. Quick question for you, Stephen. Do you um, do you, have you noticed any benefit um, in terms of um, using hypnotherapy? Because I'm in my day job, I'm a clinician. So any benefit in terms of helping people overcome certain habits like smoking or certain types of like alcohol abuse? I just was curious as to what your thoughts were in terms of its effectiveness. Yes, yes. Thanks um, for that question. And uh, yes, I have, especially in my early career, I did a lot of things with uh, people's habits and um, smoking is one of them, weight loss, um, other things that's a practical health oriented uh, sort of thing. But I indeed found it uh, quite uh, interesting uh, that some, let's say, tendencies or uh, issues uh, that could be habit forming or more difficult um, may again lie someplace in, in the past. And so we're talking about cause and effect. And, and it, it could be just as simple as with a particular issue with a client that says, well, okay, I've got this you know, particular problem. It might even be connected with asthma, let's say. And uh, obviously they can't smoke. <laughs> that, that should be out immediately. But uh, working with them with this general idea of let us go to the origins of the problem. And who knows where that might take us? It might be, let's say, when someone was five or six years old and it seemed to be kind of a suffocating emotional atmosphere that they can't breathe. And that might be it. And then from that point, we could say, not only do we have to discover it, but how can we unravel that? How can we deal with that? Find some remedies for it. And sometimes it's called inner child work where we take that five-year-old and then we go to a, a, a nice place, a warm place, a place that they can meet their spirit guide or angel or who, whatever that child would feel comfortable with. And from there, excellent breathing passages. You can stretch out, you can now breathe easier and many other suggestions like that, that reinforce that healing and the goal that that particular person would need and want to do. But sometimes, especially in my work, um, you know, it's a very broad question. Let's go to the origins of the problem. It may not have been in this lifetime. And I have had a few instances of people who had uh, died in fires and they were surrounded with smoke. And uh, it was, of course, emotionally frightening but here was the, again, breathing in that harsh air and the smoke and so forth, and they've got asthma today. So, you know, however the, the origin takes us, that's where I go. I always follow the client wherever they happen to go. And then from there, we say, okay, thank you for the story. We have the origins. Now about the healing, and, and that is when we go to 
well, let's get that person out of the fire. What what happened? You know, after that, let us have a circle of other loving beings there. You know, to just send loving healing energies to this particular personality, and especially the the lungs, the throat, the mouth. Feel it, breathe it in, start again, and bring that. Uh, healing energy into the present body and incarnation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. We're going to go ahead and move on to Juju now. Um, all right, Juju, you're up now. Hello, hello. My name is Juju Raffi. Are you able to see me? Okay. Great. Okay. I can't see me, so I just wanted to make sure. So my name is Juju, and I am the author of Weekend Warrior, Going to Visit My Mom. And I want to tell you, um, this book is a very special project to me. It's a very personal project to me. Um, this is a story about um, a child who's going to visit their parent for the weekend. But before I get into what the story is about, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm a mindset coach, a speaker, and a mompreneur. And um, basically, I see clients one on one virtually, mainly because of COVID, but virtual works really good for my coaching business. And I also run a women's empowerment group. And um, that's also mostly on social media, but we meet in person as well. So I'm in the community a lot. Um, I'm always in the business of helping other people. And um, I'm currently in Virginia Beach. I'm originally from New Orleans. And um, I have a six month old baby and an 18 year old in college. So I've got one in the crib and one in college. <laughs> um, but the inspiration for my book is from the one who's now in college. So we'll get to that. Okay, so I could talk about the book now, my favorite part. Um, I'd rather talk about the book than myself. But this book is called Weekend Warrior, I'm Going to Visit My Mom, and it's part of a series. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the series in a moment. What I want to tell you is about the purpose of the book and the reading of the meaning of the book. The book is to promote positivity among split families. So this book is for young readers. It's also for the parents to read uh, with the children or for the children to read out loud uh, by themselves. But it's basically shedding a positive light on the experience of kids going back and forth to their parents, between their parents' homes. So oftentimes that can be a negative experience for children. And I wanted to show that it doesn't have to be a negative experience. For me personally, um, the reason that I wrote this book was sort of an outlet for me. And I'll talk about how that can be a really good outlet. Writing about your story can be a good outlet for the aspiring authors later. But um, for me, I was active duty military and I was deployed, and at the time, um, my child's father and I were going through a divorce, and because I was deployed during our divorce, um, my child's father automatically became the primary custodian. We had joint custody, but he automatically became the primary custodian because my address was outside of the United States. So when I came back from my deployment, I found this information out. Uh, it was a surprise to me. I didn't know how the system worked. I didn't know anything about where the address was or anything like that. So I didn't feel fully prepared for what had happened. What ended up happening was my son, his his main address was, was at his dad's house. And so I became the non-custodial parent and I had my son summers, weekends, holidays, spring break, whenever he had a break from school. And at first that was okay because we were living in the same town. But later I got stationed somewhere else and his father also got stationed somewhere else and we went separate ways. So like a lot of parents who don't live in the same home or in the same town, now this child has to go back and forth for visits. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but typically it's not fun and it can be there can be a lot of emotions involved there, uncertainty involved there. Um, but what this book shows is that it can be a fun experience for both the kids and the parents, as long as everyone is positive and focusing on making this a good experience for the child. So um, the book, Weekend Warrior, Going to Visit My Mom, is about a weekend where this child goes to visit his mom. And the story is actually about my son and I, um, and it's, as I mentioned, it is a series because the next 
book is going to be going to visit my dad. And it will talk about the more common thing that you hear is a child going to the dads for the weekends, right? Um, and then another book in the series will be going to visit the grandparents because there's times where the kids go for the whole summer to the grandparents or leave the parents or a parent to go visit another family member. So there can be fears there, there can be uncertainty there. And the purpose of the book and the series is just to show that it doesn't have to be a bad experience. It doesn't have to be scary. Um, and it is very common for kids to go back and forth between family members or parents' homes. Um, and it doesn't have to be ugly. So I just wanted to show that in this book. And I do have the book here with me so I can show you a little example. This is the cover. And if it's the, if it's the right time, I'd like to read a little bit from the book, I think. Going to the next slide. Sure, go yeah, right okay. ahead. Awesome, thanks. So, this is um, actually I have a bonus daughter. She's eight years old, and I gave a copy to her. This is her copy. She's very happy to have an autographed by the author copy. <laughs> and um, when I gave this copy to her for Christmas, she was just thrilled. And I wrote her a little note inside that said, "We love all of our weekend visits together." because she's my stepdaughter. So she goes back and forth between her mom's house and our house. So she's going through the same thing that my son went through many years ago. Um, so this book is basically showing the child traveling, which often happens. Um, now, in some cases, parents are living in the same town and the child may just be going down the road to mom or dad's house for the weekend, right? But in other cases, you have a child who's got to travel far away to go to the other parent's house. So there's a lot of logistics involved there. And at the end of the day, it's about making sure um, you feel safe and you feel love no matter what's happening and that you're getting full support from all ends of the spectrum, from both parents, from both families, from the house you're leaving to the house you're going and vice versa. So in my case, um, my child was traveling by plane and so that was big and scary um, for him as a young child, but he has been traveling by plane since the age of seven. So there may be a lot of kids experiencing that. I think my video went away, so I'm coming back on here. Um, and so it starts with today after school, I'm going on a trip for the weekend. I'm excited because I get to fly in an airplane by myself. I'm going to visit my mom who lives far away. So the really interesting thing that I did here with this book, um, the illustrations are very colorful and it's easy to read for kids, uh, probably ages five and up, any child that is spending the weekend with their parents and that's all the way up to age 17, will get the story and will understand the story. But the print, the font is big, it's easy to read. And one really fun thing I did was I connected with an illustrator who was able to make these images um, and what I want to say about the images is we have a very diverse international family in my home. And so when it came to choosing the characters for this book, I wasn't sure what character, what type of characters to choose. I wasn't sure whether to choose girls or boys or what. So to alleviate the confusion, um, I chose animals <laughs> and I thought it would be fun to just use a a different variety of animals. And the last interesting thing I want to say about what I did in the book was at the end of each page, there's a question for the reader. There's a question for the child, and it is a thought provoking positive question about the situation that they're going through. So on this first page, it says, Hey kids, what do you like most about going on weekend trips to your mom's house? And so it just gets the child to talk about like, well, my kid, for example, says, I get to fly in a plane and they give us really great snacks. And he ended up falling in love with traveling alone, which could be very scary for a lot of kids. And it was the first time. Um, but after that, he didn't want anybody to fly with him. He loved flying by himself. I'll just read a little bit more. My bag is packed and I'm ready for my trip. My dad helped me pack my clothes, snacks, and my favorite blanket. Bye, dad. See you in a few days. And then on this page, the question for the kids is, hey kids, what do you like to bring with you when you go on a trip? 
So it's showing a good relationship between the child and the house that he's leaving because that parent helped him pack his bags. And then it just asks a simple question about what do you like to bring with you when you go to the other parent's house? And it shows him getting off the plane, um, getting assisted by the flight attendant there. I feel like the video keeps going out here. So I'm just going to keep talking instead of showing you stuff. Um, something's going on with the connection. But anyway, so um, the book goes on to show that he has a wonderful weekend at his mom's. He has a great time. There's no negative talk about the other parent. There's no negative talk about um, the other home he's staying at. It's all about having fun where he is, what they do together. It asks more questions. Um, it shows a, a healthy relationship between the mom and the child, the kind of activities they do together when when he's visiting or she's visiting. It shows them having fun. And then it shows them cooking together, playing games together. And then at the end of the book, uh, it's time for him to go. So, of course, that's always a sad time um, for the parent who has to say bye, right? So it shows the mom, she's sad, she's waving to the kid. He's getting on the plane and he's saying goodbye to his mom. And he goes back to the other parent's house, in this case, the dad. And the dad's waiting for him, picks him up at the airport and takes him home. And so he talks about what a great weekend he had. And it's just a quick weekend um, to his mom's and then back to his dad's house so he can go to school the next day. And it shows him going back to school the next day, telling his friends, all about his weekend. So um, you can find the book on Amazon. And this is, like I said, the beginning of a series. Um, and the book is a paperback book, really easy for kids to hold and to read. And I have been fortunate enough to be contacted by schools. So this book has been featured in elementary schools. Um, I have also donated copies to um, the offices of several child psychologists who are using the book when they're talking to families about um, living in separate homes and trying to promote positivity among those families. So this book has definitely gained um, some popularity in that arena. And I'm really happy to share the book with schools, libraries, um, young readers, parents. I'm also in some um, parent parenting groups on social media where I've mentioned the book and they absolutely love the idea. I don't think there is enough conversations about kids living in homes with separate parents. I think it should be talked about a lot more in a more positive light, in a more positive way. In the 18 years that I've dealt with my son living primarily at his dad's, I have never felt like I had the support that I needed. And so writing this book was a huge outlet for me because I have always went out of my way to make sure um, there's never been more than two months that I don't see my child still. And, um, I've always made sure it was a positive experience when he was with me, whether we were traveling together, he was coming to stay with me. We were talking about us. We were talking about his dad. We were talking about the school. I always made sure to pour out the love, support and positivity and pull resources where I could find them from friends, from family, um, getting him involved in activities when he is at my house, um, because even though he's not here throughout the whole school year, I was able to provide a great experience for him. And I want other parents to know they can do that too, um, even if it's a part-time parent. So moving on to advice for aspiring authors. Um, I definitely, first of all, there's some fantastic advice that's already been given on this, on this WebEx. So the other authors gave some amazing advice about pursuing what you want to write about. And um, Paco, if you said something about just writing what you're interested in, write about what you're interested in. You don't, you can create a story or just take what you're interested in and start writing about it. Because like he mentioned, there is someone else interested in what you're interested in. There's a lot of other people interested in what you're interested in. So just start writing about it. Um, don't be afraid to tell your story. It took me a long time to even feel comfortable about writing this book because that meant telling a lot of people who maybe didn't know that I was the part-time parent. And um, that's something that it was a hurtful experience when it happened 18 years ago. And I was afraid to talk about it for a very long time. So writing this book was very helpful and therapeutic for me as well 
to kind of put my story out there and do it in a positive way that can now help other people. So when you turn your, your pain into something that can help other people, um, you can do that through writing stories as well. And my biggest piece of advice is just go for it. Just start writing, start putting pen to paper or start typing out your story. Um, and you'd be amazed at how many, how much, once you start pouring it out of your head and out of your heart, how many pages you can actually create a whole book. Um, and one huge tip that I'll leave you with is I used a dictation feature that Microsoft Word actually has, um, or it's also known as talk to text that um, I just started talking slowly and clearly and it's typing my words on the page and that probably saved me years. It takes a long time to sit down and write a book. It can take people many years to do that, but with the talk to text feature, I just kind of talked to my screen and told my story and lo and behold, multiple pages later, there was a story all typed up. All I had to do is get it edited. So that's my big tip for those of you who are trying to put something together and don't think you have time. Juju, thank you so much. Anybody with questions for Juju today? It's Juju, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering how um how how's the feedback been? I'm not sure if your other family members have read it. Like what kind of support have you gotten from other family about the book? So the main person that I was dying to hear their critique is from my son. He's 18 now. And um, he actually gave me very positive feedback um, about writing the book and about the way I presented yeah. our, our experience together. He loved that I chose personal items from our story and from him to place in the book. For example, um, when I show his traveling bag and this Mexican blanket, he always had this blanket every time he came to stay with me. He always had this green raggedy blanket and I made sure to include it in the book. Um, also, the activities we did together in the book were specific to my son and I. So he really appreciated that I made a book about him and it meant a lot to him. Um, the rest of the family thought it was really neat that I could tell our story in a positive, uplifting way instead of, I mean, of course, people saw, my family members saw all the tears over the years of wishing he was here every day, of wishing that um, I could be the one taking him to school in the morning, or I could be the one helping him with his homework. But instead, I was the fun parent um, for the weekends and the summers and the holidays. And sometimes that was sad for me. Um, so the feedback has been, it's, it's so nice to see that that story, which is very common in our society society today, it was very nice to see that in a positive way and in a positive light. We're going to go ahead and move on to our last author of the day, last but not least, Tiffany Gallup. Well, my name is Tiffany Gallup, and I am the author of Penny's Magical Feather, as well as The Magic of Mindfulness. Um, a little bit about me is that I am also a um, pediatric special needs nurse, as well as the founder and owner of Let Me Be Great Children's Yoga. And um, I kind of uh, wear a lot of hats. Um, I'm a mom of many, but children are my passion. So writing for them and um, teaching them yoga and ways to be healthy has become my one of my favorite pastimes. Um, as a child, I, I wanted to be an author. I didn't realize it was going to manifest in, in my adult life, but it has been such an amazing journey, um, and I wouldn't change anything about it. Um, I love watching children learn as well as uh, grasp the social, emotional education and literacy at the same time. It's such um, a gratifying experience for them to be able to understand emotions that they experience, why they experience them, and what to do with what they are experiencing in a positive manner versus making bad choices that could cause consequences um, that could possibly last forever. So in my book, Finney's Magical Feather, um, we teach children the proper techniques on how to breathe. Um, but just to backtrack a little bit, the nurse side of me, um, realize that there's some children that have tactile um, situations or issues going on. A lot of our children or a lot of the children that I work with um, have a diagnosis of some sort, whether it's autism, epilepsy, uh, there's, a, there's a diagnosis of some sort. And so I realized that 
touching books may not be comfortable for them. Um, might be the weight of the book, might be the, the feel of the book. So what we went ahead and did is we created four of the same book. We have um, the hardcover book um, of Finney's Magical Feather, and then we have a soft cover book. And the soft cover book comes in like a matte finish as well as a glossy finish. And then we also have um, another book that um, it's for children that might have eyesight issues. So the colors are deeper and richer. Um, and the, the type of book that that is, is it has like a more of a um, cardstock feel to it versus having the glossy or the matte or the hardcover. Um, I did mention that I'm a mom of many. So that includes having children that want the same thing um, and not writing your name or their name in it can cause chaos so what we did was we created books with the uh, different covers so you can see that the soft cover has a different cover than the hard cover and um it's the same exact book on the inside but you can now distinguish whose book is whose by what the cover is and not having to write a name in it because that it happens moms forget um so that's just the nurse side of me and i wanted to address that so that everybody could feel comfortable holding my book in their hands and reading um the words that are in it um so a little bit about finney's magical feather once again like juju had stated i wasn't sure if i wanted to use people so um i think the universal people universally can um connect with animals so i used animals i used a little girl her name is finney and she's a hippo um and the reason that i love finney's character is because she's a hippo Right? Like who, who, what hippo do you know that does yoga? You know, when you think of a hippo, you think something that's huge, something that has the flexibility, something that is just there. Um, but Finny has a very vibrant personality. And unlike many hippos, she is able to do yoga. So I wanted to, um, with that message, I wanted to reach out to any child that was a little overweight or um, was struggling with personal identity issues or um, maybe how they looked to let them know that it doesn't matter how you look, you can still accomplish anything. And in this case, Finney was able to accomplish doing yoga poses um, despite the fact that she was a hippo. Um, Another thing I, I love about this book is because, once again, I am a pediatric special needs nurse, I wanted to address children with special needs in my book. So there is a character, and his name is Jaden in my book. And as you can see, right on his feet, he's a little tiger. On his feet, he has what we call AFOs, or um, ankle foot orthotics, and they help um, children stand. Now, would you believe in our yoga classes, we actually have children that wear AFOs and they are still doing yoga and they're happy about it and they're safe about it. We do allow parents and caregivers and nurses to attend our classes as well, but we don't want people or children who have um, any type of different ability to think that they're not able to do yoga. So we included that in our books to make it more inclusive. Um, in our book, we have, of course, many different characters. Um, we have Elliot the elephant, and we have Jaden the tiger, Finney the hippo, and then we have um, Jeremy in the back. And each of these characters have a different ability. Um, and diff in more books to come, they're going to reveal what their different ability is, and they're going to be able to connect with children that have abilities on any type of spectrum. Um, in this book, I love that we promote kindness. Um, Finney helps her friend Jaden choose a mat in the beginning because he's just, uh, I don't know. He really doesn't have a lot of self-confidence. He's like, uh, I'm here, uh, you know, not really sure of himself. And Finney hops right in and she says, um, I want this mat right in, She's very vibrant. I want this mat. And Jaden's like, uh, I'll guess I'll take the other one. And I use the color gray in this book because gray is not really a vibrant color. Um, and I wanted to let that color depict that he's kind of uh, just not so sure of himself. And then what they do in the book is they learn how to do their breathing techniques. So if you can notice in this picture, the feathers are a certain color. They're kind of dull, right? And as the book goes on and they learn how to take those nice breathing techniques, the colors change on their feathers, right? 
And that during their breathing techniques, breathing can be magical. Um, in the nursing world, breathing is everything. If you're breathing, you're alive. <laughs> and we want, we want that. That's good. So we want to teach the children how when things don't go their way or when they feel like their mind and their, um, their mind and their emotions and their heart are going super fast, the first thing that I want them to take away from this book is to take a deep breath. Um, we teach the children that peace begins with them and that if they can just pause for a very quick moment and take a deep breath, it honestly can change the course of their life. Um, studies have shown that if you just take a deep breath, it can really change your emotions. Um, it can change. It can. It just breath is vital. Um, the in the back, I teach the parents and the caregivers and the nurses um, the yoga term for breathing, and it's called pranayama. Um, so we teach the benefits of that in the back of the book so that they can also understand what is the big deal about them breathing. Um, they do this in our book by using a magical feather, but there's also some science behind it too. And we, we use that information so the parents can be just as educated as I am about what's going on in the book. Um, one of my other favorite things in this book is relationships. I love building relationships with children, with parents, with the community all together. And one of the reasons that Finney is upset in this book is because she has been preparing for a Valentine's Day dance with her dad. Right? Isn't this the cutest picture ever? She wants to go to a Valentine's Day dance with her dad. However, she is scared to ask her dad because he has a basketball game on the same day. Her dad's a basketball coach. Um, as many children in the community have parents that are either coaches or teachers or have some other um, profession that requires them to do either after hours work or um, do some type of activity with other children. So she is just scared to ask, you know, dad, I really want to go to this dance. And she's been preparing for it for almost feels like what's forever. She wants to wear this beautiful dress and she has this picture in her head that she's going to dance with her dad, but she doesn't ask. She does not ask. And at the end of the book, when dad picks her up from yoga class, dad has tickets to this dance already because he knows how important this dance has been to her as she's been preparing and decorating the gym. And she's so surprised. She did not think that dad was gonna go to this dance with her. And dad says to her, I'll read to you the, one of the last pages um, because it's just so uplifting and so encouraging. It says, um, daddy, Finney jumps up with excitement. Hey love, are you ready to go to the Valentine's Day dance tonight? What, seriously, we're going? What about? Your game, questions Finney. It's next week, Finney, not this week. I wouldn't miss a dance with my little girl any day. So I love, and this picture is just showing how she's reaching for a hug, which in, which encourages daughters to give their dad a hug and, and have that connection with them. And then it also encourages them to just ask and never assume that something is that isn't and that is the gist of Penny's magical feather i had found that your book was available on amazon is it available any other way or is it just through amazon um no so our book is available it's available at barnes and noble it's available on amazon it's available um at walmart.com um we have it's available on books a million um this book is available almost everywhere that you can imagine. Um, all of the links to where this book is um, available are located on my website, um, or you can go to, of course, Amazon, which it could be to you in two days. Um, if you order on my website, though, I will autograph it and send it to you and put a special message in there if you're interested. Um, and it just maybe take a day or two longer, but it's autographed and it's specifically to the person who requested it. Right. Tiffany, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? I do. My advice to aspiring authors is to just go for it. Um, no matter how silly it sounds on paper, because this story definitely sounded silly to me when I first wrote it. I can't tell you that this story was changed so many times 
to reach, I didn't want the story to be long. And originally it was like 900 and something words, you guys. <laughs> um, it's down to 555 words. So out of that of um, was birthed three or four more books. So no matter what your idea is, always write it down. And if it needs to be changed, if it needs to be um, altered in any way, that's not a bad thing. Um, editing is not a bad thing, although it can be an exciting process. It's not a bad thing. It can teach and show you um, where to get better. And um, it can also create more books that you didn't know that you had within you. So I always tell all of the children that I meet that are interested in writing, um, but don't know what to write. I always encourage them and let them know that there's always a story within you. Um, you just have to sit down, maybe take a couple deep breaths and put it on paper and enjoy the process. All right, any other questions for Tiffany? Hey, Tiffany, this is Paco. Okay, quick question for you. How has it been um, balancing, you know, being um, a nurse as well as uh, having your, your, your own, uh, uh, basically your own business doing uh, with your yoga practice? It has been exciting. What I love about this entire process, because I do get the question, how do you do nursing? How do you write books? And how do you own a yoga business all at the same time? And what I have found is that it all goes together. It all meshes together. With children, it doesn't matter what your special ability is. You can always, always, always take a deep breath. And you can teach that verbally or non-verbally. Um, one of the most heartfelt stories that I have, and I'll make it super short, is that I've had a child in my yoga class who started with me about two years ago and was nonverbal, only using a device um, to communicate. And um, throughout our yoga classes and her consistency coming, she can now talk. And one of her first words was yoga in my yoga class and talking about tears mm -hmm. of joy, um, because we didn't think that we had heard it right. Um, but she repeated it and she is now able to use the techniques um, that she learned in yoga everywhere that she goes. She recently um, went to the doctors and there was a picture of someone doing yoga on the wall. And that picture was able to help her remember our classes, which was able to help her calm down, which could have been a chaotic situation and scene in the doctor's office turned into a conversation about yoga and her calming herself down by herself without the help of a nurse or a caregiver or a family member. And that to me is phenomenal. That is why I do this, um, to give the, the, the children the tools, social emotional educational tools to get through what could be um, the most chaotic situation ever. It turns out to be just another, just another day just another way to calm themselves. And they actually go and teach other children. So we have a program called Peaceful Places within the community where um, teachers and parents and caregivers and um, clinicians and um, counselors, they create places within their community, whether it's um, their classroom or their office, that's a peaceful place where it's a safe place for a child to calm down. And it's amazing how the kids will go there calm themselves down without having any disciplinary actions and come back and able to talk about it, draw about it, or explain in a in their way what happened and how they can fix it. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing and it encompasses all aspects of literacy, um, mental and physical health and educational health as well, really. We've added, oh, one more thing too, is we've added in the back of this book, I always put goodies. Um, in the back of this book, not only do we have um, things for the parents, like I said, to describe what breathing is all about, but we've also included affirmations, um, beautiful pictures of affirmations so that um, on any given day when a child is feeling sad, like Jaden was at the beginning of the book, they can read these affirmations, I am smart, I am calm, I am kind to help remind themselves those positive things. Um, and when you think positively, that will change your emotion and your mood. And then you can go on and either talk about it or just go on and not talk about it, but not have your emotions affect the rest of your day. So we, we have that as well. And for the um, 
summertime, we launched the Magic of Mindfulness, which is a workbook. So it has um, all types of awesome resources, which really is good for clinicians and teachers, um, counselors to not really have to have a conversation, so to speak, or not know where to start a conversation. But if they're coloring, this says our kindness rocks garden. So they have to come up with things to put on their rocks that are kind. And then that's a good way to talk about, okay, well, what, what are some kind things that you say? What are some kind things that you would like to hear? Um, there are so many awesome resources in this book. I this was this was fun. This one was a fun one. The magic of mindfulness, coloring mandalas. It talks about patterns. It talks about um, there's so many conversations that can take place from this one book. It's just phenomenal, and it allows kids to get off of technology. Can we talk about getting off of Zoom and any of those other? I mean, even WebEx, honestly, because mostly at this point we're over a year in of this pandemic, and we all want to see each other um and for some of us it's not possible but with this book it allows the children to take a break off of technology and do something positive um and give them tools to move forward so when we do meet again we know what to say we know how to handle the emotions of actually seeing another person <laughs> it really for real <laughs> face to face again so they're, they're awesome resources and tools in both of these books and they're my book babies Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. I hope I answered your question effectively. Tiffany, thank you so much. And thank all of you authors that came today. It was really wonderful listening to all of your different stories, your backgrounds, um, your imaginations. Um, at this point, we will conclude our virtual Meet the Authors program. And for those of you watching, I would um, ask that you seek out the books by these authors. Clearly, we have a lot of talent here and books that are certainly worth looking at. So thank you very much and have a good day.